My name's Bob Joss, and I'm Dean at the Stanford Business School. It's my great pleasure to welcome you this evening to a wonderful program on board governance of nonprofits. Uh, some of you, in fact many of you, came upstairs from our nice board fellows kickoff and reception downstairs, so I welcome you for the second time, and then some of you have just joined us for this evening. Uh, this is an event that's co-sponsored at the business school by two of our very important organizations. Uh, one is our public management program, PMP, which has been around now for about 35 years. It, it's a real testament to innovation at the business school, and it was something started by former Dean R.J. Miller, whom I think some of you in this audience would know. I certainly know R.J. well and still rely on him for great counsel. And R.J. felt that it was a proper role of the business school to uh, help people understand the challenges of managing in the public and nonprofit arenas and wanted to see this program here. And it's a program that has survived and now really thrived over a 35-year period, which is remarkable. Uh, it's a program that tries in to do two things, really. It tries, number one, to uh, take everything we know about management, about organizational performance and getting organizations to achieve their mission and see how much of that applies in the nonprofit world and how hard that is to apply oftentimes in the nonprofit world. At the same time, it's also focused as well on trying to understand even in the for-profit world that right level of social awareness and social accountability that really does ultimately influence the viability of the firm, the long-run viability of a private firm. Uh, so it's a terrific program and it engages about a quarter or more of our students at any point in time. Uh, and so that's one co-sponsor. And the other is an equally fantastic program that's been around uh, also for a long time. It is ACT, our alumni consulting teams. And this is a program that our alumni put together a number of years back uh, to tap into the skills of our alums uh, who were willing and interested and able to give of themselves in a pro bono way uh, as consultants for nonprofit enterprises. Uh, we have now some 300 projects under our belt throughout the Bay Area, uh, benefiting uh, an enormous numbers of people and organizations. I will tell you that as dean, one of the nicest things that I get to be involved in, and I get to be involved in a lot of nice things throughout the year, uh, but one of the great things is the letters I receive from those nonprofit organizations who've had an ACT team, one of our alumni consulting teams, thanking me. Of course, I didn't have anything to do it, but I, I love to take the thanks and spread it to all of our people who put this together. It's an extraordinary volunteer effort uh, on the part of our alums. And so both of these, the PMP and the ACT, really make us very proud. Uh, and they're really central to what we're about at the business school, which is how do you help people achieve their goals and objectives through managed organizations. That's just how things get done in society today and it's what we specialize in and it's so important to all of us and the quality of our lives. When those things get done well, it makes a difference and when they don't get done well, people, people suffer. This evening we have a wonderful panel and it's my pleasure to just introduce the chair of the panel and let him take it from there and I'll have to tell you this is another great pleasure at our school is the terrific alums that I get a chance to meet and be associated with. And our panel chair tonight is one of those, Bill Meehan. Uh, Bill I've known for many, many years, and Bill is one of those Renaissance people, literally. He, uh, I, because he was in college at Columbia University, an English and comparative literature major. Um, and he came to Stanford and got an MBA. He's had a long career at McKinsey. He's been there 26 years which is, of course, the leading strategy consulting firm in the world. Bill's run the San Francisco office. He's run the West Coast. He's been in charge of the firm's private equity and venture capital practice. He's been in their financial services practice. He's chairman of their investment committee. Uh, he's vice chairman of their human resource committee. So he's 
done just about everything at that firm and is obviously um, a very, very accomplished practitioner in that whole arena of management and strategy. On top of that, he has a lot of nonprofit experience. He's a glutton for punishment when it comes to nonprofit boards. I can't think of a better guy to be leading this. He's a member and former chair of the Board of Directors of the United Way of the Bay Area. He's a member and board uh, of the board and former chair of the Philanthropic Research Incorporated. He's a member of the board of the Symphony in San Francisco, of Fordham Prep. He's a member of the California Business Roundtable. He's a former member of the boards of the Committee on Jobs and the Oregon Shakespeare Festival. So you can see a tremendous breadth. Um, you know, the Chinese have a wonderful saying, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember. I do and I understand. Uh, of course, understanding is the deepest form of learning and that is what we strive for so often. Now, Bill's clearly somebody who's done both hearing, seeing, and doing. But you know, in our research about adult learning, we know that if you not only do something, but you also teach about it, you actually have the deepest level of understanding. That's just from proven research. Uh, and Bill has proven that by going the extra step of actually teaching all this. He teaches for us as a lecturer at the GSB, which he's been doing for a number of years. He teaches a course in the strategic management of nonprofits. Uh, and a number of our public management students, of course, have had his course, and he's had to think a lot about what he learned and also how do you teach this. Uh, uh, as well, he's been on the board of advisors of our journal, the Sam Stanford Social Innovation Review, and has been a faculty affiliate now from the beginning of our Center for Social Innovation, which brings all these programs together. So I could go the whole evening introducing Bill Meehan. I better stop. Please. Join me in welcoming Bill Meehan and his panel. Bill? Uh, thank you, Bob, for that introduction, which I can only describe as uh, luxurious. <laughs> uh, I think this is the uh, uh, fourth or fifth governance panel we've done uh, of this type, normally in and around the board fellows kickoff. I now understand why I agree to chair these panels every year. It's so that I can receive such a wonderful introduction. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, two or three introductory remarks. First, just to briefly, uh, by name and institutional affiliation, uh, introduce our distinguished panel, uh, starting on my immediate left, Ashley Bourne, who is Executive Director of Sustainable Conservation. Next is Bert McMurtry. Uh, who is, has been many things, is now chair of Stanford University's board. And finally, uh, on the end, Jan uh, Ma Ma Masaoka, who is executive director of Compass Point Nonprofit Services, who many of you will know is amongst uh, the better known and uh, more distinguished uh, consulting firms uh, on the topics of board governance and other interests, uh, issues of interest to nonprofits. Uh, the way we're going to do the panel tonight is I will start out with some introductory remarks and then each of our panelists in turn will provide a brief introduction to themselves and then speak for uh, several minutes. Uh, in turn, we will then open it up to questions and answers. Uh, we have the opportunity as well. I think you've all received a case um, aptly titled The Boring Board Meeting. Uh, we'll give you a short opportunity to read that and talk about it amongst yourselves, uh, and then we'll use that to generate some more discussion and questions and answers. We have till about 8.30 tonight. Uh, so that's the program for this evening. Um, I, I was going to provide a couple of more comments of introduction to myself, but I think everything that could possibly <laughs> be said about me that's true has been said, including uh, a few additional things. So I I'll just move <laughs> right on. Um, I have something I call the nine attributes of uh, excellent nonprofit boards. Uh, I, I won't take too much time by going through all of them in detail. I will read them briefly. Uh, I think they're available on uh, uh, one of the business school's website. And then I'll just focus on two or three that I think you might find most interesting before turning it over to our panel members. Uh, 
The first attribute uh, is an ambitious mission clearly identified. Next, intermediate goals that are directly related to the mission. Third, a board's role and responsibility in achieving that mission is explicit and well understood. Excellent boards have a small group of committed and cohesive leaders, an appropriate composition of members to provide skills, perspective, and financial support, and a well-defined and understood structure for handling key tasks. Best practices boards have a process for interacting on important issues that ensures the right capabilities are regularly brought to bear, a process that ensures that board members view their time as well spent, and processes that engage board members in the substance of the organization. Uh, you, you'll probably notice that these are broad principles, not strict rules, and that is because, at least in my experience, I think the experience of most people, is that uh, if you come up with hard and fast rules for nonprofit governance, you can find an organization that obeys them strictly and is not well governed, and you can find another organization that disobeys virtually every one and yet uh, is outstanding uh, in its governance as well as in achieving its mission. Let me call attention to two or three of these. First, uh, an ambitious mission clearly identified. No, no doubt some of you said, I thought we were talking about governance, not mission. Why is he talking about mission? And that's because in my experience for nonprofits, as perhaps from many organizations, they follow the old Sicilian axiom that the fish rots from its head. And for nonprofits that are not successful, they too rot from faulty missions. Uh, there is, it's very, very hard to provide excellent governance for an organization that does not have an outstanding mission, and usually, but not always, an outstanding mission statement. Uh, when I teach my class here, we have 50 or 60 students for one class bring in an evaluation of a mission statement for an individual nonprofit. And by the end of that hour and 45-minute class, we usually collectively judge that probably two-thirds or three-quarters of those mission statements fall far short from being judged as effective. And so I would uh, urge any of you as board members or as executive directors, uh, if you're trying to raise the standards of your board and its governance process, to start with a deep review, evaluation, understanding, and commitment to the organization's mission and in many cases a rewriting of that mission statement to be sure that it actually communicates to all constituents, those that know the organization well and those who might just uh, become familiar with it in a, in a more uh, passing way can understand exactly uh, what that organization does. One of the most popular questions that anybody who fancies themselves an expert on nonprofit governance gets are things like, how big is a good nonprofit board? The answer is 17. <laughs> uh, so the long and the short of it is, I, 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 uh, you know, folks like Jan and I who do a lot of work for nonprofit boards, you get, and then the other question you get is, tell me about what are the perfect term limits? Uh, I mean, they're all important questions. Unfortunately, they do not generally have simple answers. Uh, I've seen boards of five or six people that are extraordinarily effective. I'm on the symphony board, which has over 85 people, and most people would judge that to be an extremely effective board. Uh, and there are boards of, of, you know, all numbers and sizes that are terrific and awful. And if you have a very large board, there's any number of structures and processes you can put in place to make them very effective and there's nothing you can do to make a group of six people who are dysfunctional uh, more functional through structure and process alone. Uh, what you do need, I think, is uh, a small group of people who are deeply passionate and committed and have the right skills. So if you have a board of 10 or 12 people, you'll never have more than three, maybe four of the core people uh, who are really uh, committed to it. If you have a board of 85 or 75, you'll never have more than 12 or 15, maybe 18 at the max. Uh, the rule of thumb I always use is a board can have about 10 or 15 percent of members who are not demonstrably contributing to that organization. When it gets to be more than that, we all join the board, we look around, and we discover that we really don't have to do anything for this organization to be a board member. 
But if you join a 12-person board or a 75-person board, and after a couple of board meetings, you realize, hey, basically, people contribute to this organization. They may contribute financially. They may contribute their skills. They may contribute their passion. Uh, but they contribute, and we get that the board has that kind of ethic. Uh, the last comment I'll make uh, about what I think is an attribute of, of, a, of a very good board is this focus on the substance of the organization. Uh, I, I think most very good boards ha contribute at least part of their board time to what I call the thing itself. If it's a symphony, there's a musician who talks to you or plays. If it's a reading program, you have a kid who's learned to read or a mother whose kid has learned to read. If it's an AIDS uh, uh, organization, you have an AIDS patient who's been helped or a caretaker whose uh, brother or sister has been helped. Uh, so many of us go to nonprofit board meetings and we get the finance committee report, the audit committee report, the operations report, the accounting committee report, the executive director's report, and at the end of it we say, hey, I mean, you know, I'm not here for the finance report. I am here because I care passionately about old people, or I care passionately about teaching kids to read, or I care passionately about dyslexia. Could I please come in contact with the thing itself, if you will? So I'll leave it uh, with those three sort of overall observations and turn it over to Ashley. Okay. Um, I'm Ashley Boren. I um, got my undergraduate here at Stanford and then got my MBA in 1989. Um, I am currently the Executive Director of Sustainable Conservation but have also served on the board role uh, both at AC as a board member and chair of ACT, um, also as a board of a small foundation and then also newly aboard on the board of a public company, a private public, uh, actually not public but a private company. Um, but today I'm going to speak from the perspective of an executive director and I'm specifically going to speak from the perspective of an organization that's relatively young. We were founded about 12 years ago and how we've evolved from what really when I got there about five years ago was um, a small organization where the founder had created the board by basically inviting his friends to come on and serve as what he called advisors and they may, he made it very explicit that they didn't have to raise money. Um, and it was a place where when I got there it was actually hard to get a quorum um, at board meetings because a lot of people weren't showing up. So I'm going to take you through sort of the steps that we took to make it a much more, um, and what I believe now is really a highly effective board. So one of the first things we did, we started out, we were, well, uh, Sustainable Conservation is a nonprofit environmental organization. Our mission is really to transform the discussion from business or the environment to business and the environment. And we do that by partnering with business and finding innovative, cost-effective solutions to tough environmental problems. So it's just a background of who we are. Um, we started out as a project of the Tide Center. Um, the Tide Center is an organization which uh, serves a very useful service to new nonprofits that don't have the capability to run human resource systems, accounting systems, et cetera. So you can act as a project there and they'll take care of all of that for you. Um, after we had been there about five years and our budget was about half a million dollars, we outgrew that and so we had to become our own 501c3 and we used that opportunity to talk to the board and say your responsibilities have just become more significant because now you are not just really advisors but you're a board of a, a 501c3 and that brings all its duties with it and sort of very explicitly stated the expectations. And the other thing we did was set term limits. Our term limits um, are two three-year terms it's extremely helpful in moving folks off who aren't particularly engaged but are filling a board spot. We also have a stipulation that if you've served as an officer of the organization, you can actually serve up to 10 consecutive years before you'd have to roll off. That's an extremely useful way to keep people that are particularly useful to the organization and particularly engaged and has worked really well for us. Um, we started meeting more when we started. When I started, the board was only meeting twice a year, and there were no board committees. So if you missed one meeting, you know you missed a year of activity, basically. <laughs> um, so our board now meets three times a year, and we have very active committees. We have three committees; they're each chaired by someone, and they meet anywhere from three times a year to actually our development and communication committee meets probably almost 20 times a year, mostly by conference call. Um, 
We also really focused on trying to change the nature of the board meetings themselves to be very sub substantive discussions where we really wanted to hear input from the various board members on key <coughs> issues of what the organization was facing. And this was kind of a trend away from updates. You know, coming up and telling everybody what had happened in the last six months, it just, you get, you're just talking at people the whole time and not engaging them. And that was not very motivating for board members. We took care of the update portion by creating something what we call end of the month notes. So at the end of every month, I basically give the board a email which says, here are the highlights of what happened this past month on a particular program or the organization overall. And that way you don't have, if they're reading them, which our board members love these end of the month notes. I mean, they, they just, they re really do read them all the way through. Um, you can really focus the board meeting itself on the more substantive issues and they feel much more engaged. They feel like they actually are contributing that way and that's made a huge difference. Um, we also specifically thought about recruiting. Um, we, as we work with business, we have representatives from the business community. We do a lot of work with agriculture, so we have representatives from that community. We have people who are recognized environmentalists, basically to represent the constituencies with which we work in our everyday uh, with our projects. But we also went out specifically for types of expertise, um, marketing, people who could help with fundraising, um, uh, particular program expertise for the type of work we were doing. And also for, um, which something I really wouldn't, for energy sometimes. We had a few people where you, usually you're not going for only one thing, but don't discount the amount of um, change someone cre can create just by the energy that they bring to the board. And I have a few just really energetic um, board members and it's, it's contagious to the rest of the board and that's made an enormous difference. We also recruited specifically for leadership. We knew we needed a new board chair and we recruited somebody onto the board with the idea that he would be a great person to lead the organization through the growth phase we were expecting and we're successful on that. So, and that I will say is another, that's been very key for us is the chair position of the board Having somebody that really is truly committed, believes in it, has partnered incredibly well with me, um, has made a huge difference for the organization and also for the satisfaction of my role as executive director. It's a lot, um, I'll get to this a little bit later, but one of the things I really appreciate from my board is when I get challenged on something. I, you know, what you don't want to have is a board say, oh, you're doing a great job, keep going. You want somebody who's really read into all the issues and said, have you thought about this or have you thought about that? And then your collective thinking, you're going to get a better, pro uh, better product and you have more impact in the long term. Um, we engaged um, the board much more thoroughly in long-term planning for the first time. We'd done three five-year plans. The last one was about um, three years ago. And that was the first time we actually really, before the two before that, we had basically brought to the board and said, approve, and they said, that looks great, check off. But there was no ownership, obviously, if you do it that way. The last time we formed a board staff strategic planning committee, and so there were three members of the board that were very engaged, and then we engaged the full board through some survey and also an off-site retreat. And that's created tremendous ownership of our five-year plan, which we're very diligent about checking in with and planning from on an annual, annual basis. And then lastly, uh, just sort of the thing itself, <laughs> for us that's a little tough because we work with industries like the dairy industry and we work with auto recycling facilities really. Um, but I did take my board to a dairy in the Central Valley and you know I think almost all of them except for the guy who is a dairyman on the board had never been on a dairy farm before. Mm -hmm. So to actually walk around the dairy, understand how it worked, mm -hmm. talk to a farmer, a number of my board members said, you know, I had never talked to a farmer before. <laughs> um, made a huge difference for them. Um, so we've started doing at least one site, type of site visit every year, and that's been in incredibly valuable. Um, so, and I would say it's paid off. So I've gone from, you know, not being able to get a quorum to, to the point where actually it's unusual for a board member not to make a board meeting now. We almost always have kind of full attendance. And the organization's grown from half a million dollars to over two million dollars, um, very diversified revenue source, um, and uh, 18 staff, and you know, really thriving. So um, the last thing I'll end on is you asked me to say what I appreciated. I mentioned the one aspect of being challenged on um, issues from my board, and also just that genuine enthusiasm and commitment and support for the cause makes it really makes you feel good about the work that you're doing every day when you can feel that from your board. Um, 
what I don't appreciate, which I was also asked to do, <laughs> is that, oh, you're doing great, go ahead, do more, you know, without really knowing. We do, it sort of becomes a little bit meaningless if you don't feel like they're really understanding the types of work you're doing. And the other pet peeve is I've had a couple of board members who are terrific board members, but they are so hard to get a hold of. And, you know, having to pester through email and calling secretaries to get a response about whether they're going to make a board meeting or not, that's, I'd say, what I, probably what I least appreciate. <laughs> and I don't have any more of those board members anymore. But. <laughs> so. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, if you don't mind, I have to leave for a moment and respond to a couple of emails. <laughs> 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 Bert? Thanks. I'm uh, Bert McMurtry. I have uh, was spent a dozen years in industry and then 25 <laughs> years full-time in the startup venture capital business and have been retiring from it for the last 10. <laughs> have, that, have that pretty well done now. And I've been focusing in my uh, retirement on not-for-profit boards, a few. I've been on uh, two university boards, Rice University, where I did undergraduate work in Stanford. And, uh, and then the Carnegie Institution of Washington. I've gotten off the other two when I became chairman of this board on the 1st of July. Uh, this board is, uh, uh, you'll be pleased to know, those Stanford people here will be pleased to know that it, at least so far, has run very well. And, <laughs> and we're watching. Uh, it, it's a large board, 34 people, and uh, the bulk of the work being done through committees, but very, very talented people. In a few, few minutes, I'd like to focus on uh, three questions. Uh, one uh, is, can boards really make a difference? And I'd like to take that seriously. Uh, and second, what's your role as a, as a, as a director or a trustee compared to that of the management, the president or the executive director? And third, uh, what do you think about fundraising in your organization? <laughs> what's your world view of fundraising? On the question of can boards make a difference, I have... Uh, I have for you good news and bad news. Uh, the good news is that boards can make an enormous difference in the organization primarily by selecting the right leadership, selecting the right president, the right executive director, and changing that person uh, if and when it's required and doing it in a timely manner, uh, which is something I've never learned to do, but uh, it, it, trying to do it in a timely manner is, is really, really important. And so the impact that the board can have on an organization is huge in selecting the right person to run it. The bad news is, if you've got some good leadership for the board at the management level, then it turns out if the board is really good, the board can marginally improve the overall performance of the organization. The bad news, that, and that's bad news in a way because you you'd like to think you could make a big difference. And I'm telling you, you can't. Uh, you're you're going to make a modest, positive difference. The really bad news is if your board is not very good, or God forbid it should be bad, you can make a huge difference in the performance of the organization. <laughs> you, can, you can kill, you can literally kill the organization by, by, by having a board that is not very good. Uh, and that is, puts a lot of pressure on you as a trustee or a director or whatever role you're in, as a, in, a, in a governing body, puts a lot of pressure on you because you've got not too much leverage on the good side and you can fall off a cliff on the downside. But I frankly think that's great incentive and it's important to keep that in mind and keep that in mind as you evaluate your other uh, trustees and the overall performance of the organization. Uh, the second uh, question that I wanted to address is what's your, what's your role relative to that of the management? And those are very different roles. Uh, uh, but it is not the role that some trustees pursue and some managers would love to see, and that is your role is not to select the management and then just turn them loose completely and hope for the best. Uh, there is, in fact, a governance role uh, to be accomplished, and that has to do with providing guidance and counsel and feedback to that management and to the entire team, and, and try, but, but trying to understand the difference between your role and the role of the management. In all the boards I've been on, uh, in many, many company boards over the years and, and a few not-for-profits, 
I've always had an arrangement with the head of the, the, the president or whoever the manager of the organization is. I've always, always had a deal with that person that I want to have full and complete access to everyone in the organization. Two-way communication completely open between me and anybody in the organization. But it's really important if, if I am ever perceived to be interfering with the management of the organization, I need to be called on that very quickly and I need to get a change. Never happens. But, but it's an important mm -hmm. understanding to have. And if you have that source of information uh, from multiple, multiple sources within the organization, your ability to help the management has been increased dramatically. And so please, think, if you think about what can you do in your, in, in your organization, develop a lot of contacts and relationships within an organization so that your information is not completely filtered by uh, the, the person who is the, the executive director or the president, that's a very unhealthy person for, position for someone to be in where they're supplying a board with all the information the board's ever going to get about what's going on. It, you really need the, need the contact. And the final thing is I want to ask you about your attitude toward fundraising. Uh, I've found that that's a uh, – fundraising is, a, in most organizations, a very necessary but often a controversial issue. And there's some really, uh, I think, peculiar – ideas about fundraising. A lot of people who are, who, who, who think they are in the fundraising business are really in the business of trying to persuade people to give them money when those people shouldn't be giving them money. I mean, they're, they're really sort of trying to take something away from someone. And, and I wouldn't, uh, and, and, and very often if people think about fundraising that way, they really don't want to be involved. Who wants to go on a stick up, you know, you really, you, you really don't, you really don't, and and but I've never quite, I've never understood that because it seems to me, if you're passionate about an organization, and you get involved and you want to help them fundraise, then your job is to help the organization expose its opportunities to philanthropists of all kinds. The philanthropists are going to decide what they want to do with their money. And when they decide to give you some money because they really understand what you're doing and are enthusiastic about it, they're going to be happier than you are. I mean, it's a wonderful thing the way this part of our society works. And so you're not taking money from anybody. You're exposing them to opportunities. They do not have to choose your entity. But it's your obligation to expose your entity in such a way that it will be, it will be as favorably received as possible and you get the organization gets gets a fair hearing. Now, I've not addressed. Do do you want to go raise money yourself? Do you want to be the person asking for funds? My my wife, who is involved with some not for profits, is is very effective in the in the development process and developing relationships, and is highly respected, and is terrified of asking anyone for money. Mm -hmm. And 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 so she has a very simple arrangement. I don't ask people for money. Now, it turns out she asks people all the time, not by asking them for money, because, but because she's such a good presenter and a good missionary for the organizations that she's involved with that people, in fact, are very receptive, but she would be terribly uncomfortable sort of making the ask. And my advice to all of you, when you find people like that, the dumbest thing you could do is ask them to ask. Uh, figure out a way around that. Um, those are my introductory remarks, although I did want to finish with one thing as we've talked about enthusiasm and commitment, uh, passion for an organization. One thing that drew me to the uh, Stanford board and helped me understand even before I was on it that it was in fact an unusually effective organization is that if, when they list the criteria for uh, potential membership on the board of trustees at Stanford, the first criterion and the second and the third are identical. And it is a passion for Stanford. And that is a tremendous help. And now they're very important other questions, of course, but you better get those right. And if you get them right, you have a good chance at building some real strength. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara Chan. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jan Masoka, and I, I am the executive director of a nonprofit organization. In fact, one of our board members, uh, Shelley Rate, is here. She's a board fellow um, from the Stanford program. So um, 
I saw there's somebody here to call me to account uh, <laughs> if I say anything amiss. Um, but I, I actually wanted to talk a little bit more here from my role as a consultant to nonprofit boards. Uh, Compass Point uh, contracts with about 300 nonprofits a year for consulting of one kind or another. In fact, one of our consultants worked with sustainable conservation on their strategic plan. Um, and I myself probably consulted 10 or 15 boards a year. And so, um, and I'm also on a couple of boards. And so I thought, I, um, actually, as you guys have been talking, I changed my whole talk because I, um, so I think I really liked a lot of the things you said. And I said, I want to say something different, which is two, uh, two things that I don't think you touched on. One is what you, sh what you should want to get out of being on a nonprofit board and how to do that. And also to try to prevent you from wreaking harm on a nonprofit board. <laughs> Uh, so those are two topics that uh, these people I have skipped over for some reason. Um, let me just tell you something. I'm on two boards right now. One is the San Francisco Foundation Community Initiative Funds, and it's a small board. There are five people on the board, um, and we get the business done very efficiently. All of us have backgrounds in nonprofit management, uh, and it's a fiscal sponsorship organization, a little bit like the Tide Center. Tide Center is. and. Um, and just to contrast that with, I'm also just recently become the board chair of the Asian Pacific Islander Wellness Center, which is an Asian AIDS organization uh, based in San Francisco, but with Bay Area wide services, including a primary care clinic. And one of the things I really love about being on the board is that there are people there from very different uh, backgrounds, very different economic backgrounds, very different educational backgrounds. Um, most of my personal friends tend to be people like me, which is kind of, uh, straight Asian women with kids and we drive minivans and you know we're so boring and the people on <laughs> and the people on this board uh, one of the first people I met on the board is a person who grew up in Hong Kong and then went to uh, was uh, through a variety of circumstances ended up in a refugee camp in Thailand came to San Francisco and had a sex change operation um, it has never been to college uh, and so there's a variety of people, and it's much more challenging than the other board I'm on because, uh, because there are very different kinds of people, and we have very different views and different backgrounds to bring to bear. And those kinds of community groups are, uh, I think, on uh, many of the ones that you'll be joining the boards of, and which I think is really where my heart is, and that have a lot of, uh, have a lot of people on them who are on their first boards, for example. Um, and who may not have, for example, the finance skills or the background to do some of the professional kinds of work that boards often ask them to do. Uh, I, I also just wanted to mention, I also write a, a newsletter called The Board Cafe. Does anybody here already know about it? Some people, oh my goodness, wow. Well, there are 32,000 subscribers to it, and there's a subscription form out there, and I also wrote a book on boards, so I have way too much to say on boards. Uh, so just a couple things about how, what I think you um, might think about getting out of boards. And, the, and this is very much in line with how to keep from wreaking havoc on boards. And one of those is to look at it not just as an opportunity to contribute, but as an opportunity to learn. And um, Dean Joss said at the very beginning, he said, uh, we want to take what we know about management and see how it applies in the nonprofit sector. And then in kind of the reverse way said something like, um, and also to see how the right level of social awareness can help businesses. And so the implication is that what we, what the business sector has to teach nonprofits is management. What the nonprofit sector has to teach the business sector is social awareness. But actually, I want to say there's a lot to learn about management in the nonprofit sector. The term mission statement, actually, which Bill talked about, is something that comes from the nonprofit sector. Long before IBM had a mission statement, um, uh, many, many civil rights organizations in particular, the mission statements actually came out of the anti-slavery movement. Um, uh, first came into the private sector out of churches there. Almost every uh, component of Sarbanes-Oxley is already in place in the nonprofit sector and is common, ordinary, universal practice. Um, and I think that a lot of the skills that you can learn in the nonprofit sector, for example, people that have learned how to, as a result of being on the board or elsewhere, have learned how to recruit, train, field, supervise, and even fire volunteers. Think of how well they can do all those things when they can actually pay people. <laughs> uh, 
So there's a great deal to learn, and it's very worrisome to me that um, actually one of the things I once asked in the board cafe, I said, "What's tell me a time when you've been effect when you felt effective as a board member?" And almost everybody came back who wrote back, and we get dozens of letters every month from the board cafe readers. Um, almost everybody who wrote back gave an example of a time in which they gave advice and it was followed. Okay. So I, I understand that, um, but I also know that in effect, though, when you, when you unconsciously believe that you're effective when people take your advice, that you're not going into a situation where you're there to learn. And that, uh, you know, uh, I've gotten a lot of recognition as a nonprofit leader, but nonetheless, if I were to go on the board of a pizza company, for example, or an airline, I would start by learning. And I would urge people from the private sector to do that as well. And then to think about, um, think about how people, if you, let's just say that you were going to give away $100,000 of your own money, you would probably start by thinking, um, well, what causes are important to me? Is it sustainable conservation, for example? Um, is it civil rights? Uh, and then you would start to think about what are some organizations that are doing something interesting in that area? And then you would find a couple and you would give them money. Now let's compare that with how people join boards. Somebody they know asked them. So instead I think, think about what are the causes that are important to you? Um, what are the organizations that are really making a difference there? And seek those out. Uh, there's also, just to let you know, there's also an online board matching service now called BoardNet USA. Um, which you, it's kind of classified ads where you can register if you don't have other ways to look at that. But before you join a board, really think very clearly, not just what do I want to contribute, like how many times do I want to feel like they followed my advice, um, but also what do I want to learn, what do I want to get out of it? Because the most common experience for people leaving boards is to say to themselves, I didn't get out of it what I had hoped to. Whether that was getting to know the board chair, having an experience to ma of managing volunteers, of raising money, um, of really learning about something new that's interesting like dairy agriculture. So I would urge you to think.